All right, I'm seeing 11 o'clock and I really love starting these things right on time, although people come and join us as we go, which is amazing and great. Uh, and we love to have that happen. So welcome everyone to webinar number three in a series of five webinars with the Open Education Ontario Fellows. And that's a program of eCampus Ontario. We have six amazing fellows um, working on this series, sharing their knowledge, their research about uh, open and other open um, types of practices. Uh, in this particular webinar, Aaron Lung Langle, always get that wrong, Aaron. That's okay, it's Langel, but that's good. Langel, that's so close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Laura Killam. So Aaron is from Laurentian University. Laura is at Cambrian College, and they're gonna talk with us today about quest-based learning. And I'm gonna turn it over to them to get uh, them to talk. And uh, with a couple of minutes to go toward the end of the webinar, I'm just gonna do our book giveaway. So we're giving away a copy of An Urgency of Teachers by Sean Michael Morris and Jesse Stommel. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of an update about eCampus Ontario upcoming events. So thank you very much, Aaron and Laura, for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And we are excited about trying a new and innovative approach to this presentation. So what Jenny has shared with you is a link to um, our website. Uh, and she just shared it again. Thank you so much. So what we're going to ask you to do is instead of us telling you exactly what we're going to talk about, we provided some topics and you can choose the order in which we're going to talk about them. We're prepared to do in whatever order you want because that models a quest based approach. Yeah, I think it's going to make a little bit more sense as we dig into some of the modules, why we're doing it this way. Um, I'll go back to something that Jenny said uh, in the introduction about being open. Uh, as open education fellows, the, the two of us and some of the, some of the people that are listening today, uh, we're trying to, um, we're trying to what? We're trying to be more open in the approaches that we're taking that uh, people can pick up pieces here and there. We're trying to advocate for um, open resources, like open educational resources. So I think today, um, a lot of the open in the open education for us is about uh, techniques and uh, approaches to things. So hopefully people will pick up some of that today and uh, they'll see that what we're doing today is something that maybe will work in, uh, in their classrooms or maybe they'll know somebody that can implement something like this. So hopefully people are out uh, taking a quick look at the, the titles of all of our modules and we'll get a few uh, people responding on where they want to start. Yeah. So take a look and then make a suggestion. There's a couple of different ways that you can make a suggestion. You can either raise your hand and use the microphone if you are uh, so inclined, or you can use the group chat inside of Zoom. And I'll just scroll a little bit so you can see some of the topics here. Um, let us know what most interests you. While we're waiting for a response, uh, maybe we could just talk about um, who we are. Maybe they don't know. You want to start? Okay. Of course, you're okay. going to make me start. Okay. <laughs> My name's Laura Killam. I teach primarily in uh, the BSCN program at Cambrian College. I've used some gamification in a couple of courses. If you look at the slides that we have, uh, we talk a little bit about the easy gamification, which is what I've done in the past. And in the future, actually next term, I'm hoping to go more into the um, next level. What do we call that? Deeper. Deeper. Uh, as much as I love references, my vote is for easy gamification examples. Okay. Yeah, so anybody that's not watching the chat, I think it's important to note that that's in all caps, yes. which is uh, a pretty typical thing from that particular individual. So way to go. Um, <laughs> Thank you for being enthusiastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll do my quick introduction. Um, I, uh, again, my name is Aaron Langell or Langill or Langville or really any, any way you want to say that last name. Uh, Jenny, don't sweat that at all. Um, I am a professor of computer science at Laurentian University and I have been doing sort of the easier gamification for a number of years now in order to try to motivate my students, but we'll talk a, a little bit about that in a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we can sort of dive into, into our first module. Yep. Right. Okay, so I have it up here on the screen. It is the one that says take it easy if you're trying to follow along. And if you're navigating the website on your own, engaging in, uh, in looking at what you're most interested in, that's completely fine as well. So um, I'm just gonna 
move this over a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the different types and then we can show some examples on our screens. So we've already sort of mentioned badges. Um, and usually in a classroom, I find there's some competition that naturally happens when you are using badges. For those of you that have been engaging with eCampus Ontario, you may have seen some of this competition already because they have something called a leaderboard. Have you noticed competition on Twitter? I haven't. I um, have. But it's pretty cool. So some of us try and compete to be the top, and I know there's someone here today who was the top in one of our in one of our rounds and is very very proud of that. And when you put something in a class like a leaderboard, um, it kind of encourages students to be more engaged in the activities that you're trying to get them to do. Um, you want to talk about that one? Um, well, I'm going to back up just for a quick second, and I'm going to assume that um, most people that are basically in on this, listening in on this seminar, or uh, are, are getting it after the fact are at least uh, somewhat aware of gamification. Somebody's going to have to pick that module, I guess, for us to go right into the definition. Um, so I assume that people are sort of aware of it. It's kind of interesting when you think about education, um, even, even just sort of a, a standard model of, of classroom education, that there is actually some gamification that's already in there that we don't talk about often. We like to talk about the flashier bits, which is what we're going to do today. Um, but even, even the way that we grade um, and the way that students tend to compare with their peers is very similar to the kind of concepts that we're talking about today. Uh, I, I was the kind of student, uh, especially in the lower grades, that would compare my grade to, to, to my neighbors, to the, to the kids sitting around me or to my friends. And that was our leaderboard. We would get the test back and we would sort of all compare who got 80, who got 90. Um, I won't tell you where I landed in that, that's not important. But um, what we're doing now is we're sort of bringing that up into sort of the digital age where um, it's a little bit flashier, it's a little bit more recognizable with what uh, students are doing sort of in their <laughs> off time. Hold on one second, we just had a knock at the door. Uh, uh, oh. Cool. We got a thumbs up from the we door. We got a thumbs so. up from the door. <laughs> we'll we'll carry on. Um, sorry. What did you want me to tackle in particular on the? Oh, we were going to talk examples? about. We were. I was just going through the bullet points here, and we right. have. Um, so you were doing leaderboards. We did leaderboards, right. and you were talking about how it exists in the classroom, which I would totally support. Even before I started doing badges, I think students in nursing are fairly competitive. But you also see elements of gamification in the real world. And we have a couple of examples here of, uh, you know, you can earn badges through Fitbit. Yeah. Um, so that was actually my inspiration. My inspiration for bringing this kind of thing into my classroom was Fitbit. Because uh, I remember when I got my first Fitbit, every time I did a handful of steps, it would, it would say, hey, way to go. You're, you're really doing it. You're doing a great job. And I found that to be really motivating. And the fitness industry is actually really good at this. Um, the fitness industry being a motivation-driven industry has found a way to tap into people's extrinsic motivation. And so here I am three or four years ago walking into a classroom where everybody's sleeping at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Most of the students are not uh, program students. They're not degree students. And I was looking for a way to kind of motivate them. And I, I, I found a couple of articles talking about uh, gamification and badges in particular. And when I sat down to really think about it, it seemed like something that wasn't too hard to do. So uh, we actually designed a custom, a custom website for it, which we might talk about later. Um, but in the meantime, it, it was exactly that model of, you know, getting a badge for walking, which, mm -hmm. which seems fairly trivial when you say it out loud. And yet everybody that gets one of the badges that says that they've walked from here to Australia is actually pretty proud of that. So uh, I know that when I was trying to do this and most of the colleagues, I'm pretty sure your, your idea for doing badging was the same idea, was to give that little boost of extrinsic motivation just like Fitbit was doing um, on our apps. And acknowledgement for what it is that you're already doing. So I uh, don't use a Fitbit, but I have a, a it's connected to my Samsung phone and it gives me badges and it tells me when I've, you know, achieved my goals and it tells me uh, when I've done my top steps for the day. And I have actually like at 1130 at night walked back and forth in my house to try and achieve my goal for the day. So I think that for someone like me, uh, having that motivation really helps. And I think that even ties back to some of the competition because I've walked around my living room 
to beat colleagues and friends at the same kinds of competitions for steps in the day. I, I, I've been in my living room doing circles at midnight, just, just before midnight, before things get recorded. And so you, you get that competition. So what, what we're trying to do uh, in this forum and in this, uh, in this instance is to bring those exact same extrinsic motivation techniques into the classroom. So that idea of friendly competition, it has to be friendly, it can't be cutthroat, it can't, yeah. be, it can't be World Series style competition because that's uh, potentially very demotivating. Um, so friendly competition and that that idea of recognition for things that you've done uh, that you should have a little bit of, of pride in. And um, the competition with eCampus Ontario folks in the daily extends is very friendly. And I, I, I took July off, but I just grabbed this uh, screenshot from Twitter. Sometimes when you look at that, it, that, that is actually the reason why I was doing dailies is because I was trying to both learn some things and uh, keep up with my colleagues a little bit. Yeah, and I think one of the things that happens when, so you said one of the reasons I was doing dailies was for that competition. And what happens is sometimes uh, people will get beyond the competition mm -hmm. and then it becomes habit forming. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that theory that if you do it so many times that it becomes a habit. Um, what we're trying to do in the classroom is get students to do these positive uh, things initially for badges and to do them frequently enough that then it becomes part of their normal routine so that um, we are actually reinforcing positive behaviors and positive habits so that originally they do it for the flash of the badges but then it becomes something that they carry through with them through their entire academic career that hey I remember handing in all my assignments and I got a badge once and I got a good grade in that class. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can get a good grade in that in this next class by doing those same sort of habits. It is very habit forming. Yeah. It, the dailies, I don't, I've told people this before, but they used to be the thing that I would do first thing in the morning just so that I could make sure that I, uh, I did my daily for the day. Feel free to chime in at any time if you're interested in something. We've kind of talked through a lot of the content for this section, some examples of some easy, easy gamification. Yeah, I think if we go back to the bullet points, um, so the, the easy gamification uh, ones, and, and this is, you, you'll see this a lot in the literature as well. What are the ones that uh, sort of have the fastest response from students or from your audience, and which ones are the ones that require the least amount of instructor uh, commitment. So badges and achievements, there's a, there's a number of places that you can get access to easy badging software. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up writing our own custom software because we wanted to have control over it. Uh, you've got the competition, you can see points listed as well, uh, which again is very similar to grades, uh, but, but that's the idea. And what's the last bullet point? It's oh, kind of hidden behind the, the window there. Uh, cooperation. So fostering cooperation. Uh, uh, again, when we talk about gamification, we're, we're doing similar things uh, to what students are already doing in games, whether it's board games or video games. And cooperation is something else that we can foster mm -hmm. through badges and even leaderboards in a lot of respects. It's kind of funny when students will band together to collect badges to try to knock out the person that's in first or second or third, um, they will actually cooperate and form little teams. Uh, to, and, and, and by doing that, everybody's, um, everybody's sort of participation, engagement, and hopefully academic success is kind of boosted up as well. Okay, so I see a suggestion from the audience to move to deeper gamification. Um, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to this nice little picture that we have here. <laughs> sure. Um, there are a number of techniques for deeper gamification. And what we're going to do for the interest of time is we're just going to focus on one of them. Um, deeper gamification is meant to tap into uh, sort of a deeper sense of uh, academic success, a deeper sense of engagement from the students, and is also typically requires um, a deeper level of commitment from uh, the instructors. Uh, so the, the easy things to do, badges and leaderboards and things like that, and then once you've sort of mined all of those uh, benefits, then you start to look at other things like how can I how can I engage my students at a more intrinsic level? So how can I use extrinsic techniques to uh, to sort of 
fan that intrinsic fire that they might have. Maybe they just have a little spark in the material. So one of the techniques that I find most interesting, um, and, and people talk about this all the time, uh, how do you remove the linearity of learning? Uh, and and I, I think as instructors, most of us get students at some point that say, you know, the class was great, but the beginning was so boring because I already knew that stuff. Or, uh, you know, remember when we spent three weeks on topic X? Well, I'm never going to use topic X in my career, but the rest was fine. So uh, often we get these, uh, these comments that lead us to thinking, like, maybe I shouldn't go through the textbook, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Maybe there's another way. So one of the proposals, um, and, and there's a, a great white paper by Haskell, 2013 um, that talks about quest-based learning and again uh, in keeping with uh, gamification the idea here is to play off of something that the students are already familiar with there's a lot of games where you enter the game and you you can pick your path you decide which way to go and ultimately you're picking your quest mm -hmm. so you know what what do you want to do do you want to go and um, destroy this creature? Do you want to go and find this loot? Do you want to go and save this individual that's, that's, that's in the game? And, and you get to pick. And ultimately, to complete the game, you have to do them all, but you get to pick the order in which you do them. And what's nice is that players get to express their own play style. They get to express their own personality. But in, a, in sort of a, a classic linear classroom, they're not afforded that kind of option and they don't get to express, you know, I am most interested in this, so I'll, I'll do this first. It's like eating your dessert before your dinner, right? right? As long as you eat it all, who cares? We, we won't get into the parenting thing, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's for another seminar. Uh, but the idea is um, how do we give them agency? or control over, over the way they learn. And this one's, this one's tricky. I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that this is as easy as throwing a couple of badges at somebody for handing in all their homework. So what was on the screen, what, what's now leaving the screen, because oh, it took me so long to get to it, is you kind of have the picture of the linear learning where it's you know uh, a, a couple of sequential chapters in a book and then some sort of evaluation, and then you carry on with more sequential chapters and an evaluation. And, and what we're trying to do is remove that and go to this almost tree root style uh, diagram that you see on the right, where students follow a path. And the, every path can have a content module, an evaluation module, an exercise module, uh, some sort of things that, uh, that allow them to, to both learn and be evaluated. And then the idea is that they feel like they have a sense of choice, a sense of control, a sense of agency, which is a very engaging and very empowering type of um, learning process. Not trivial, um, and, and maybe somebody will ask us how we get there, but that's, that's the idea. Somebody's asking about workload next. That's that's, I, that's, I just want to cut in one. Go ahead. and cut say in. Yeah. that it is much more interesting for students to follow what they're interested in, as, as long as they're still learning the things that they need to learn for the course and meeting their learning outcomes. I actually had a student thank me for the approach that I was using in a class where I was giving them choice, and they were able to do what they were interested in. They said, you know, that's the way that millennials learn and she 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 called herself that and so gone are the days where i think we as educators are in the dictator role of this is the best way for you to learn i think that our, our students are coming into the classroom more and more cognizant of what is actually relevant to them and if we don't make it relevant to them then we're kind of wasting our time talking about a concept that they're not interested in when well, they might be and we're wasting in. theirs too yeah yeah because sure. they're they're not going to learn the material as effectively for sure um i just want to talk about a quick example and then we'll move to workload so last year i taught a course and this year i might be teaching it again i i believe i'm teaching it again i'll find out this afternoon but my plan for the course is instead of going through all of these concepts in a particular order i am going to teach students the foundational information in the first three weeks so you know what is a research study what is concept analysis what does a concept look like the kind of foundational things and then give students quests they have to complete all the quests by the end of the year because they're going to be tested on them. But then instead of uh, lecturing in class and talking about, well, what is suffering, we'll have um, 
case studies and we'll do the application in class and students can explore what concepts they think are relevant to the things that we're talking about in class and then I'm getting more sort of engagement from this group of students. Um, there is a lot of work associated with developing that what we're talking about, right? Yeah, what we're talking about here is is sort of a, a, a pedagogical shift. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't this isn't a matter of doing, you know, uh, doing well on a test and getting a sticker, which is which is right. the equivalent of a badge. Um, this is this is a lot more about fundamental pedagogical processes where whereby, you know, instead of ordering a textbook from one of the publishers, um, I will have to put a plug in for open textbooks at some point here. Right, right. Uh, whatever the case may be, even if it's an open textbook that has a linear model, which which is still uh, very common in textbooks, we're talking about breaking that. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only are there pedagogical issues, there are also delivery issues because we have to talk about whether or not this is appropriate for a face-to-face -face, uh, delivery versus an online delivery. So again, uh, something to touch on maybe if somebody picks one of those modules right. coming up. Which I see it as I see it as challenging. So I wouldn't go from no badges in a course to a quest based based approach. And it might take some different iterations. I, I tend to like to go big when I make changes to a course, um, but it, it is a lot of work. So I think the fact that I've taught this course in the past with badges and those badges are associated with different learning outcomes, it's easy for me to then take that and form quests out of it. Because yeah. some of that foundational work is done, and I think I think starting with badges or starting with one of the easier things in general, whether it's badges or leaderboards or points, um, gets you thinking about student engagement, which is a good start. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if this is not something that you're familiar with at all, uh, or if you're pitching this to a colleague um, and they're not familiar with with the idea of using extrinsic motivators to to try to boost academic success. Um, you know, jumping to quest-based learning is is probably a really big step, um, and doing something simple like points, leaderboards, badges uh, gets them in the right frame of mind to start thinking about. Okay, now what's the next step? How do I take a deeper dive mm -hmm. into this whole uh, extrinsic gamification thing? So I think you're absolutely right. Like I, I'm not sure that this would be the first step I would take, um, and definitely there's a lot of work involved. And um, if you think about a course that you've taught say more than three or four times, and you're kind of entrenched in the way that you've done it, it can be very jarring to think, okay, how am I gonna, how am I gonna tear this textbook into pieces and give students the freedom to follow their own path? Um, but this is something that, that's being worked on uh, uh, by us, by other people, and hopefully, you know, in, in fairly short time, there'll be some guidelines and processes on how best to tackle something like this. Also, so very important point is you don't have to do it by yourself. There, yeah. there are a lot of, like you mentioned, open resources that you can use. There's things that already exist, so you don't have to start from scratch. If you have a hard time finding the things, you can also engage your students one term. I'm actually doing this in, in one case. Engaging students at one term and helping to come up with ideas or the gaming elements that could be then used in subsequent terms. So you can even turn that building of components of it into uh, into part of an assignment if that works for your course, right? Right, so you're talking about the content modules and even some of the testing modules and stuff like that. Yeah, how do you, how do you sort of break out of that linear textbook style model? Um, engaging your students is absolutely one of the ways to do that. Uh, engaging your peers and colleagues and then engaging uh, people that you know, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or just online in general, that are doing these kinds of things. Usually when they're into um, letting people know that this is what they're doing in their classroom, they're also usually into being asked questions mm -hmm. and helping. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time they've written a blog post saying, I am using deep gamification in my classroom, they're probably willing to answer questions about it and, and to offer any assistance that they can. Uh, so that's the good thing about building up your sort of personal learning network mm -hmm. and getting involved with people that are doing similar things and leaning on them as you as you start to make small steps going forward. Follow this guy on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. Okay. Ditto. Well, you, you post a lot more gaming stuff than I do. I do post some gaming stuff because I do engage in a lot of discussion around gamification, but he's all about 
gaming, right? That's, that's like what you teach. Well, video games. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to know about the video games I played when I was 12, by all means, follow me on Twitter. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a good time. Okay. Sure. But you can learn stuff from those video games that you can then put into yeah. your, your teaching, right? To make your learning actually fun and not boring so your students aren't <laughs> falling asleep in your, how, in whatever, what, what size of class do you teach? Uh, about 180, about 200 students. Yeah. And they're not falling asleep. At 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, some do, but I, I can't help that. That's, that's beyond me. Um, should we wait to see if anybody wants to pick another topic? Or, Let's or take are a we going to pick one? We could, if, but I, I, I've been watching. You kind of, I think it would kind of flow if we talked about OER. So if there's no objections... There's no, let's, let's talk about how we would integrate OER since that sort of flows. <laughs> we got a good, good with that's, that's a vote. I'm, that's as good as a vote. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, actually, this is, this is sort of where I wanted to land with this. So if you, if you, if you have been watching uh, the video and if you've been watching the scrolling uh, with, that, with that image of the linear model and the nonlinear model, um, I, the question ultimately is how do you how do you break out of that chapter one chapter two chapter three mode and this is something that I've been thinking about for a little while and um, when uh, when there was an opportunity to talk about research ideas for for eCampus Ontario I, I kind of wanted to take something that I knew which was gamification and tie it into something that, that was of interest to eCampus Ontario, which was the open educational resources. And I, I started to wonder if we couldn't use OERs. Um, so the, this is, uh, if you're not familiar with a, an OER, I think there is a link to- There is to, a wonderful presentation, which you really have to watch. Yeah. I personally think that Cable Green does an amazing job explaining what they are, but right. in a nutshell. Do you want to do the, the definition of sure. OERs, then I'll come back in? In a nutshell, they are resources, and they could be any different type of resources, we could be talking text, video, whatever, that are freely available for you to use in your classroom, and they also come with a license that allows you to take those, you can use them as they are, or you can adapt them. Depending on the license, you may have to share alike, or you may not be able to use it for commercial purposes, but if you're talking about it in the classroom, usually you can use pretty much everything Thing that you come across and they're actually really nice because when you start to piece those together I was just talking to someone earlier today about this actually you can sometimes grab different pieces from different places and create this whole new customizable learning experience from your students whether you're gaming or not yeah is that that's yeah absolutely and and there's nothing saying that you need to be doing shallow or deep gamification in order to leverage OERs. Mm -hmm. um, I think the interesting thing is, is what you just said, you know, grab different pieces from all over and create this custom um, effective package for your learners. Um, the interesting thing is if we start to decouple the textbook model, you almost end up in an OER style delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you are able to find open resources, that are self-contained modules such that a student can follow a particular path and, and consume an OER, um, uh, an open educational resource in a way that they didn't require foundational knowledge and, and they're able to digest it, and they're able to make sense of it, then you've succeeded in allowing them to follow that quest path. Right. And I think that by the nature of how a lot of these OERs are developed, um, they don't have heavy requirements for foundational knowledge. They are self-contained modules. modules in a lot of cases, whether they're videos or text content or uh, infographs or exercises, they tend to be largely self-contained. Now that's not to say that you could jump into a, a, a quantum mechanics without basic mathematics, but it should be fairly clear by the time you start following that path that you're not ready. So mm -hmm. if, we, if we go back to video games, this is like picking a quest that's too hard. So you go back, you gear up, you get better armor, you get better <laughs> weaponry, uh, you, you level up your character, and then you try that quest again, which again, um, even though it sounds that like we're making it harder for students, we're still giving them agency, we're still giving them control, and we're letting them do it, not necessarily completely on their own time frame, but through a process that feels like their own decisions. Mm -hmm. So if we, can, if we can find, if we can curate uh, open educational resources to populate the modules on our tree, 
I, I'm very clearly a hand talker. I can see it in the video. So I hope I hope this is working for everybody. If it's you can see tree. it in the tree, if you see it in the tree, um, if we can populate those modules with open educational resources, I think you take a lot of the stress of figuring out how you would cut up a textbook. Um, that can be very stressful, like which chapters can go before others. If we can do that with OERs, I think we take a lot of the stress and we take a lot of the work off because um, there are a lot of open educational resources out there already developed by other instructors, uh, by instructional designers, by students that we can leverage. And that takes a lot of the pressure on the idea of doing off of the idea of doing quest based learning. Also, so just people come into our classrooms with all kinds of different levels of expertise. So, you know, maybe Aaron needs to go back and level up his armor because, it, you know, in one of my classes, I'm, I'm guessing you're not a nurse. Not so much. No. So he might not have experience in like, let's say a long-term care setting. But if I'm teaching a group of students who have worked as PSWs before, maybe they don't need to level up their armor before they tackle that sort of higher level application exercise. Look at you talking like a gamer. This is working <laughs> out really well. Uh, yeah. And that's exactly it. And, you know, I have computer science students that take computer science in high school. Um, but I start my computer science class from, from having no knowledge of computer science at all. So those students uh, would definitely benefit from the ability to jump past, mm -hmm. still do all of the ass assignments, still do all of the evaluation components, but to be able to pick and choose. The other thing that, that we haven't really touched on um, is that a quest-based learning approach allows students to follow um, personalized quests that you may not cover otherwise. True. So, so you might have, maybe, maybe I have a, a side quest on artificial intelligence in first year, which is normally a fourth year topic, but somebody that's really keen and somebody that has a bit of background, there's no reason why they couldn't follow that. If, if they don't need to spend six weeks on the foundational material, mm -hmm why not spend a bit of time doing a little mini AI assignment? So the quest-based learning actually gives you a little bit more flexibility to do content or, or to give access to content that you wouldn't normally cover. And options for students. Um, I see a comment in the chat about it requiring good labeling and good front end, sorry, front end annotation of the content. And, and I think that yeah. is really important. You have to clearly describe what your quests are. And I would say they should be attached to whatever your learning outcomes are. Yeah, or and, sideways. Yeah, like absolutely. I, I think that there's there's a, a really good point there saying, you know, if you're gonna follow this path, you must have, you know, some knowledge of the following mm -hmm. uh, the following topics. And and this is very pardon me, this is very similar to a game that says you must be level 10, you must have the following equipment, um, otherwise you're just sort of wasting your time. So that's a really good point. Um, labeling the paths. With the with what knowledge you need before you proceed is is definitely uh, would definitely help uh, avoid a lot of angst when people get you know a couple of hours in and then realize they're not prepared. Yeah, yeah. and some people might just want to challenge the boss at the end. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, a hundred percent. Okay, so um, I'm looking to the chat to see what it is that we want to talk about next. Um, and I guess you can keep rambling if you want in the meantime. I, I like, I like the implication that I can just ramble on command. <laughs> um, I'm sure I can. Um, and now I've got nothing. Now, <laughs> now I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Um, well, let me look. Why don't you talk a little bit? So until somebody tells us different, why don't you talk a little bit about more of the challenges? <laughs> that that's, face -to -face. Well, that Sorry. sounded like a challenge to the audience until somebody tells us different. Um, this is, I think this is probably my biggest concern about quest-based learning. I don't, I don't really have concerns about handing some of the control over to students in general. I think uh, a lot of students will do very well in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. The question is, does it work for an in-class? Well, type? ask me after next semester. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll come back. We're going we're gonna to pause this and we're going to come back um, next term. Um, you know, when you think about an online delivery model, and actually, uh, you and I attended a little uh, seminar in the spring. Is that, is that when that was? They all Doesn't fleshed matter. together. We attended a, a little seminar on somebody that was doing uh, sort of nonlinear learning. I, I don't think it was called Quest based uh, at the time, but that's that's neither oh, yeah, here nor there. That was CNIE almost a year yeah. ago. Yeah. So they were doing nonlinear learning, but it was online. 
And it was, it was a very similar model where students were able to come and go. Uh, I'm not sure that they had that sign posting uh, that had, you know, you need this to proceed. But I think the nature of the material was such that uh, you were able to go anywhere. It was a series of readings um, and then a series of questions based on the readings. So there was no inherent linearity or no, no required linearity to it. Um, so we saw that presentation. And, and I remember sitting there thinking the whole time, how could we do this in a face-to-face -face classroom? I was happy to see. I mean, I was listening, don't get yeah. me wrong, but how could you do this in a in, in a face-to-face in -face classroom? Do you have any ideas? I do have some ideas. <laughs> and so the quest-based flip is the thing that we sort of talk about, and I, I threw the title on there, and, I'm, and it's going to answer the question from the audience which is how do you teach an actual class is if everyone is on a different learning path and at different points in the course material. Mm -hmm. And I think that it all comes down to focusing on two things. One, application instead of bleh, like dictating what, the, like sort of the teaching piece. Sorry, I don't Flip. bleh in the classroom. Okay. So, well, but, that's but what it feels like sometimes this. when you're lecturing, okay? Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're the talking head at the front of the class, you kind of need to give that up in a quest-based approach. The yeah. other thing is, using the resources that you have in the room, which the resources are not your textbooks in this case, they're all the students. So you kind of need to move towards more of a group based approach where maybe he's talked about suffering or maybe I'm, I'm just referring to my old thing. Suffering is one of the concepts that we cover. Maybe he did the suffering approach and, and maybe I did the, um, the uh, not approach quest. Maybe he did the suffering quest, and maybe I did the uh, self management quest because when people are talking about chronic illness, you know, sometimes there's, anyways. So if he's familiar with that concept, and I'm familiar with this other concept, and we're talking about a case, and we're, and, and one of the questions in the case is what concepts might apply to this case? Well, he's probably going to suggest the concepts that he's familiar with, and then I could suggest the ones that I'm familiar with, and then the students can talk to each other. And they can teach each other about these concepts instead of me at the front of the room trying to do all that teaching. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, okay. it does. It's sort of leveraging that uh, that hive mind to get everybody to 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 work together and to bring something else to the table and kind of again lift everybody everybody's knowledge gets lifted together um, for sure. And and that's actually a lot like a like a work scenario. Right. Um, so you, so you're, you're giving them you're giving them that kind of IRL experience as well so in, in real, real life. life um that was so synchronized so good um and, and then the other thing we talked about was sort of the flipped classroom model like bringing it more to to a standard flipped classroom where the students are doing kind of the the heavy lifting of the readings mm -hmm. and the theoretical background and then the instructor becomes a facilitator for the applied uh the applied work or the applied knowledge and you know, it, it's it's a little bit hard for me to picture this yet in a in a two hundred person class, but I'm mm -hmm. I'm working towards it. Um, how how do you sort of flip a classroom that big in general? But but if we think about about a smaller classroom, again, as people are asking questions, if you can frame the questions as self-contained answers in a way that don't require serious background knowledge that everybody can benefit no matter what level they're at yeah um then then you've got some success on this sort of quest-based flip and we talked about um the ability to or, or you and i had a quick talk about uh sort of maybe having a three-week foundational mm -hmm. uh you know everybody's together everybody's working on on foundational knowledge to make sure they're on the same page and then even bookending it at the end coming yes. back to it um, and having this sort of linear, nonlinear hybrid model in the classroom, uh, which really, I don't think that's that's all that different than having people work on group projects or case studies midway through the term. No, um, I think it's just a matter of what are you facilitating and and how are you going to approach it, and can you make what you're facilitating relevant to everybody in the room, no matter what level of knowledge they're at, no matter what quest they're at, which is really something I feel like we should be striving to do anyhow. And I see a good comment from the audience that there's possibilities for embedding formative quizzes and focusing your teaching to support the things that they might be missing in the classroom. So you're not wasting your time talking about stuff that they already know and uh, saying that it's a very active form of teaching approach rather than just doing all the upfront planning, which I find when I do that, I make a lot of assumptions and, so, and oftentimes those assumptions about what students know or don't know are inaccurate. And then I only find out when I talk to them. 
right? Yeah, I, I would, I like that last part. Um, the upfront planning is something that I, I ditched a long time ago. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, if, if you're uh, either new to instruction or if it's simply your comfort zone, by all means, do whatever works best for you. My style um, has, has been much more effective when I let my class dictate what they need and what they want. Uh, as an example, my computer science class right now is a full week behind in the syllabus, and that's okay, because they need to be behind in the syllabus in order to figure out where we're going. Mm -hmm. Yesterday in another one of my classes, I, I asked them, I said, do you wanna do topic X, which sounded terribly boring. I said, <laughs> or do you want me to just throw all that away, grab a whiteboard marker and we'll do topic Y. Um, and 90 minutes later, they had learned everything they needed to know about why you don't get blue shells in Super Mario Karts when you're in first, but you do get them when you're in 12th. So if you want to know the answer to that, Twitter me. <laughs> I um, have no I'll, idea. I'll hook you up with an answer. But it was probably that. more interesting for them, right? Um, I think it was because everybody was sort of on the edge of their seats um, because they're all trying to design their own video games and they wanted to know how that technique worked. And so we just ditched the PowerPoint, we ditched the plan, mm -hmm. and with no upfront planning, uh, just, just my own knowledge of the subject, we said, okay, let, let's talk about it, let's do it. And, and I don't know uh, that a quest-based flip or, or some of the things we're talking about would be that different. And I think if you're doing quest-based learning, I think that question that says, you know, what do you do about planning? Uh, I think you, you plan some general steps and that's all. And then I, you, you I let think, your students figure it out. I think that you do need to have some, I'm trying to cut in because it's a good spot. You do need to have some deadlines for students. So I'm teaching a class right now where I have uh, co-created rubrics and I have allowed them a lot of flexibility. And I found midway through the term that I could set individualized deadlines with students, but I really needed to have a firm date for them to do stuff. So when doing a quest-based approach, I would say not, you have to do this and this by this date, but you have to do two of these quests perhaps by this date so that they actually have some deadlines to follow. Otherwise, what sometimes happens is students forget that the fun stuff exists. Yeah, I think there's a couple of problems with no deadlines. One, you know, every course has students that without deadlines will do nothing. Right. Yep. Uh, they need the deadlines to keep them on track in a lot of cases. Um, the other thing without deadlines is you're, you're going to end up with, say, uh, in my case, 180 students times five assignments. That's a thousand once. assignments all at once. And, and yeah. no amount of, of, of teaching assistants, plus myself, plus anybody else I can hire, are going <laughs> to get through that in a timely manner. Um, so that's not going to work. So I, I totally agree. You know, having, uh, having a timer that says, you have to have one or two of them in by this date, one or two of them in by this date, one or two of them in by this date, and that's your terms guideline. You're still giving them agency that, that says, I'm gonna do an easy one and a hard one each time, or I'm gonna do the one I like and the one I don't like each time. You're still giving them agency, you're giving them some control, but not so much control that they end up not doing anything because of, of decision paralysis kind of thing. So I find it extremely interesting that your badges are like all manual. Yeah. <laughs> Mine are yeah. not. Okay. So let's Speaking just be of clear. Workload. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, can you, can you scroll to, to, to your badges? Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's asked about the specific okay. badges, but let's throw a couple of them up there. So okay. um, my badges, uh, I know it's okay. They're, they're, they're the audience they can pick, but at a certain point we're going to take over here. Um, the my badges are designed any any of those any, any of those okay. um, are designed to uh, promote good behaviors, uh, good habits, good academic habits, good social habits that students should be doing anyhow, but often don't. Um, you know, like a lot of times they get busy at the end of the term, so they don't hand in that fifth assignment. And, that, and that's fine, I, I don't punish them for not handing it in, but if they take the time to do that last assignment, I will reward them with a badge. And the idea here, um, I'm gonna to totally lose where I was going with this, so you might have to bring me back at some point. The idea here is, is to promote those good academic behaviors. Uh, why did we switch to this webpage again? Because you do them manually? Oh yeah, good point. Um, I have, did, have you counted how many badges I have? No, but I was let's, like, this would be a nightmare. Let's say I have 40 badges. 
times 180 students okay is a lot of badges right but he doesn't teach me assistants. and my my custom badge system um is good because i have total control over what i'm rewarding the students for so somewhere on the middle of your screen it says i know that one and it's reply to a question on the discussion forum mm -hmm. um my tas have to monitor the discussion forum and then give them that badge um there is a badge down below that says always improving that says test two score is greater than test one score my tas have to monitor that now those are things that if i had the right system i could automate those badges mm -hmm. um can you scroll up a little bit the problem is i'm interested let me let me read some of these i ask my students to guess their test score when they hand it in Oh, so, if, so if the test is out of 72, whatever the number happens to be, I'll say, guess what you got? And what the students do is, is they'll put a number out of 72. And I like asking them this question because it gives me an idea of how well they understand my grading techniques. So if they guess that they got 70 out of 72, and they actually got 50 out of 72, then there's a disparity between the way that I think they performed and the way that they think that they performed. And conversely, if they say they got 50, but they actually got 70 out of 72, there's a disparity again. They're a little bit too pessimistic. So I like to ask them, I have a badge that says, if you guess plus or minus one, I'll give you a badge because it shows that you're putting a little bit of thought into it. That's impossible to automate. So I yeah. have so many badges that are impossible to automate that um, mine are all manual. It's, it's not a great system in terms of the workload. workload, but it is extremely flexible. What I have done is if you click, if a student clicks on the badge, they will um, send a request to the TAs saying, I think I've earned this, can you please check? So again, we've given students mm -hmm. the ability to say, you know, I, I, I did guess the Oracle badge, can I please get it? And, and so if we make any mistakes, there is accountability and the students are able to, to sort of pester us. And they will, us, my, the my students let me know when my automatic badging wasn't working and then I had some great conversations mm -hmm. with our IT department. Um, I'm gonna address the question in the audience. So someone's asking if I've ever had the experience of students who find badges uh, or other kinds of rewards demotivating and how you deal with that. So I actually have, um, it wasn't part of this presentation, but if you follow the links, I did, had done another presentation with a colleague of mine and some of the feedback that we received from the way that we were doing badging in that class was that they felt like it was a little childish and they didn't, they felt like they weren't actually learning anything from some of the badges that we were using. So obviously I'm going to make changes to that going forward, but I don't think that every student in your class is necessarily going to respond to badging. I and mean, then I, I, I was meaning to ask you, it kind of depends on how you treat the badges, whether or not that becomes a problem. So my badges get rewarded with things that I co-determine um, I, I, I co with the students. Yeah. So we negotiate rewards. Rewards. Your, your such, badges are like a currency. Yeah, rewards yeah. Like, like they've picked things like uh, read, my ex read my assignment before I hand it in, um, bonus marks. And so sometimes that becomes too much of a reward and that can be problematic. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I, I've had I've had similar issues. Um, let me let me give you sort of a, a quantitative view on this. Um, I the first time I introduced this, I had 180 I, I always have about 180 students. Um, I had complete uptake on the badging system. Nobody opted out on it, even though it was completely optional. I do not tie mm -hmm. it to their grade. I don't say, you know, if you don't get enough badges, then, then your grade goes down by 5%. I would never do that because that definitely is demotivational. Yes. However, despite sort of the complete uptake of the badging system, when I did the exit survey at the end of the year, I did have a couple of students say that they found it hard to keep up with the badges and that they simply didn't enjoy them which is fair it's completely fair and and laura made a point that not everybody this isn't this isn't going to be everybody's ideal extrinsic motivation mm -hmm. um, there was another student that felt that the badges helped the good students to do even better 
right. um, which I don't, I don't know is necessarily wrong. I don't, I think it's fair to give, a, uh, to give a boost to everybody across the board. I don't, I don't feel that it's necessarily our job just to help the students that aren't doing um, top notch work, but you do get those sort of comments of, you know, I, I feel like the badges um, aren't helping. And so one of the things we're trying to do as we go through is to talk to students and say, you know, how can we make this better? Uh, but it, it's definitely true that it's not going to be for everyone. Um, I think it's, I think it's much closer to apathy over the system than demotivational. I didn't have a lot of students say that they did worse because, uh, because of the badges. Um, I think it's closer to just indifference. Okay. And I, I would have to dig through this a little bit more, but I did have some students say that they felt like they're being treated like a child. Now it's hard to dig when it's a survey and that's the only response that I have. Okay. So Jenny's saying with 10 minutes to go, is there anything that you would like us to cover that we haven't yet? I think we've pretty much touched on except for defining gamification, which I, <laughs> I, I, I get, I, I'm getting the sense that the audience knows what gamification right, is. Right, which is exactly our point. So, right, yeah. so if you came in late, um, we actually have tried to run, um, run our little workshop like quest-based learning and leave uh, the control over where we go largely in your hands. Um, and so the net result of this was entirely skipping the module that had the definition of gamification, which is a great, that's a great talking point, you know, yeah. maybe everybody knew enough about what was happening that nobody bothered to say, you know, can we go back and do that one, uh, which is kind of cool. Or maybe while we're talking, somebody was like, what is gamification? And because they had access to the website, they could click on the link. And we had uh, indicated, you know, some text based yeah. things for people who may have tuned out when he was going off on a tangent and wanted to explore something it's else. It's totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I, I think we're good if you're good. Am I right? Yeah. I, I, okay. yeah, I, I don't have any tangents left in me. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> oh, references. Yeah. So um, we do have a reference list and I was going to ask your permission to put it in this morning, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, I know our librarian loves this slide. They are coming soon. <laughs> we wanted to make sure that we really gave you the best references. But, uh, you know, drawing on your expertise, if you have anything that you would like to share that you've looked at in relation to this, you are able to add comments to any of these posts so you can throw something in there. But we will have yeah. something up in the next, what, when do you want to do this? In the next couple of days. Yeah, yeah, in the next yeah we do have a list. Uh, we had to sort of prioritize which modules got done um, so, that, so that we'd have them to talk about. And this one was kind of at low on the priority list. Uh, but they are coming, so please, uh, bookmark the link if, if that's still a thing people do in 2018. We can. Um, we'll also be tweeting it out. So if you're sure. following us on Twitter, uh, by all means, uh, take a look. And Jenny, you can throw the link in the description of the video on YouTube. That's yeah, where they post sure. the recording. For so. sure. We, ha we have another question coming in. Yes. The badges you, the, the, sorry, the badges you mentioned are awarded within a course. Yes. At, at, at the current time for me, yes. I think at the current time for you, yes. Yeah. Okay. How are they related to college level digital badges? So we've looked into trying to do that here at Cambrian. Um, there are other people in the year that I'm teaching that are using badges. So there is some working together there, but currently we don't have college level digital badges. That's a discussion that we've been looking at in terms of you know how do we do something larger with open badging? But the short answer to your question is at this time, they're not where I'm working. Yeah, and there's nothing like that where I'm working. There is some facility in our learning management system, which is D2L. Um, unfortunately, I find it extremely restrictive. It would be a lot less work, but I can cover a lot less ground. It's very difficult for me to do the social badges and some of my miscellaneous badges, um, which are very, very important to what I'm trying to do. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of uptake on things like this in the next four or five years. I think. Um, there's a lot of discussion and you're starting to see campus level gamification experts, mm -hmm. either in instructional design or, or within faculty or wherever they happen to be housed. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more of this coming. I want to, I want to just mention before I forget the gamification of education is really big in high schools and primary levels. Mm -hmm. And 
I feel like we're just waiting for post-secondary education to catch up on a lot of the things that the high schools and primary schools are doing really, really well. And that is not to suggest that, that we have to make it too kid-like or mm -hmm. make it seem like we're, we're sort of dulling the edges on, on the post-secondary things that we do. Um, there are ways to make sure that we do this and to keep, to keep it at a, a level that's mature and consistent and, and academic enough, and yet still offers those extrinsic rewards um, that are that are so necessary to that that um, positive behavior support. And just before I turn it back to Jenny, because I know she's dying to do a book draw, uh, I just want to say that I use Moodle. So if you have Moodle related questions about how they work, let me know. We can connect after the fact. And I think I could probably award all the things that he does inside of Moodle. Um, the challenge with that is that it then isn't open. Yeah, and I don't have Moodle, so. So, so I don't have that luxury. Okay. So I have a custom system. And I will mention that the, the custom badge system that we are developing has a Kahoot clone built mm -hmm. into it. And uh, within the next two years, we'll be releasing it as open source software for everybody to use. It's going to take over. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we're good, Jenny. <laughs> Uh, okay, great. That was really awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your work and for sharing the link that I know you will continue to update, um, especially around the resources where people can learn more about this, some of the foundational pedagogy of it. Um, terrific, terrific presentation. So I just want to, um, I just want to let you know that uh, Jackie Tan is our winner today for the uh, An Urgency of Teachers book. So very well done uh, for attending and for asking a question, Jackie. So I only put people who ask a question into the draw. <laughs> um, I'll make sure I'm going to make sure I have your contact information, Jackie, for that. So thanks very much. Um, and also a reminder that uh, our next webinar for this series, the OEL o OE Fellows series, is Thursday, November 8th. So that's just next week with James Skidmore and he has guests Nick Baker from University of Windsor and Michelle Singh from eCampus Ontario. Michelle is our new Chief Technology Officer, so we're really extremely excited about that. Um, and it's going to be on OER policy needs in Ontario, and I think that's a really great and important conversation, so I look, really look forward to that. So that's next Thursday, November 8th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and upcoming we have our technology-enabled uh, seminar and showcase in November and our open education summit happening uh, the day before the tech technology enabled seminar. Uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you are uh, as are there. Um, somebody's asking how we get access to these recordings. They will be posted on our eCampus Ontario website. I'm about to post. I'm, I've been doing the transcriptions and I've been a little slow for reasons, uh, but we're going to get them posted really quickly on our eCampus Ontario website. Uh, and on YouTube, so you can look for our eCampus Ontario channel on YouTube and you'll see these posted there as well. All right, and that's all for special announcements. Any final words from, from the uh, Quest Base team? Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun and uh, I recommend subscribing to the eCampus Ontario uh, YouTube channel so that YouTube will email you when they go up. And, and do please track us down if you have any further questions. Yes. We are responsive. He's mostly responsive through Twitter, though. Don't email him. True. <laughs> Great. Thank you both so much. And I'll make sure to put your Twitter links uh, on the YouTube description as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you and both so much. We need to, sorry, I'm piping in at the last moment. We need Hi, to congratulate Jenny for earning her doctorate this week, defending it successfully. Thanks, That's Peggy. Maybe a little slow on transcribing a video. <laughs> I'm going to catch up now. <laughs> All right, thank you all so much. It was really great to see everyone.